True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The man towers over the child. He may as well be a giant to the toddler who's not even a meat at all. The young boy cringes as the man's rage escalates. Spittle flies from his mouth as his face inches closer and closer to the boy's. He wants to wipe it from his forehead, but he didn't move. Not a finger, not a muscle. He must stay perfectly still and do exactly as the man says. The alternative is too terrifying to imagine. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 108, The Murder of Baby Daniel. Hey, True Crime South Africa listeners. I'd like to tell you about a brand new South African podcast called Your Mom with Skulk. I love how the podcast landscape in South Africa is expanding, and I'm really pleased to be a part of that. The content in True Crime South Africa's episodes can be a little bit heavy, though, so I think it makes complete sense to balance that out with some light-hearted fun. Skulk Bezaden Hoot is genuinely one of my favorite comedians and personalities, and now he has his own podcast. Hello there, all you crime junkies, you sickos. It's Skull Beside Note here. I'm sorry to interrupt the murder or the robbery or whatever heinous crime Nicole is telling you about, but I just wanted to tell you quickly about a new podcast that I'm hosting called Your Mom with Skulk. Hello, Mensa, and welcome to Your Mom with Skulk, a brand new podcast by Telltale Media, hosted by me, Skulk Beside Note. Now, on this show, we're going to journey deep into the lives of really lucky people. Some of them are my friends. Some of them I wish were my friends. But I don't want to speak to these exceptional people, these celebrities directly. I mean, yeah, look at Mensa, I think we are all so tired of listening to celebrities. Everyone and their mother, excuse the pun, has a podcast where they interview celebrities. So we're not going to speak to the celebrities directly, but rather about the celebrities through the people that know them better than anyone, which is, of course, their mothers. I am sitting here, Mensa, in the house of Tani Gale Goliath. I am sitting in the house of Jack Barrow, Bertus Basson, Simone Pretorius, and our ongelooflike maat, Tani Tinky. Le Klaus. Le Le Klau. Le Klau. Oh, sorry, my bad. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. (laughs) The woman of the hour for me is... The Queen. The Queen. It was my favorite words of f***ing f***ing, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait for the journalist to hear that. This is who I want to speak to. Their mothers. Your favorite word is f***, but you don't like tattoos. Nee, f***. This is now rechtig, the end. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or check us out at telltale.media forward slash skulk. I mean, it would be a crime not to. Anyway, back to you, Nicole. Donkey. I highly recommend you go follow Skulk's podcast right now on whatever platform you're listening on. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank those listeners who've supported the show through Patreon or PayPal recently. A huge thank you goes out to Joran Barnard, Dominique Cresswell, Jessica, Tanya Crick, Karen Trott, and Terry Ann for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to get an exclusive episode every month, as well as ad-free versions of every week's episode, check out the link to Patreon in the show notes and sign up for a minimum of $1, which is about the same price as a loaf of bread right now. You can also support the show by supporting our sponsors, including King Online and Wallpaper Online by using the discount code TCSA10 or True Crime, respectively, when purchasing on their websites. 
and you'll get a 10% discount too. Or you can support me as an individual creator by purchasing my book, Samurai Sword Murder, in hard copy, ebook, or audiobook formats, as well as the audiobook I narrated for Jana Marx of the Krugersdorp Cult Murders. Non financial support is just as valuable, so please share and invite your friends to listen. I only realized when I started writing the script for this episode that I've chosen to do two really sensitive topics two weeks in a row. Last week, I warned those who are sensitive to descriptions of animal abuse that episode 107 may not be for them, and this week I'm discussing another topic that I know many struggle with, and that is child abuse. But as I've said before, the hardest stories to tell are the ones that need to be told the most. And Baby Daniel's story, although sadly far too reminiscent of other child abuse and murder cases I've covered on this podcast, most certainly deserves a voice. Whether or not it's hard for me to talk about or hard to listen to. With that said, I do fully understand if you need to skip this episode and please prioritize your mental health and well-being always. I will provide warnings throughout the episode when I'm about to describe specific injuries or acts of abuse. In researching this case, I used an episode of Autopsy as well as several media articles. So let's get into episode 108, The Murder of Baby Daniel. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Cases involving children are difficult for many reasons. From an information gathering perspective, it becomes difficult because there are laws protecting child victims. So even if the victim is deceased, if there are surviving siblings, those children's identities need to be protected too. And that's why when perpetrators are related to the children in question, they are not named. Also, judgments in these cases are more often than not not uploaded to SAFLI because information might slip through that could identify the children. South Africa has become even more strict about how cases involving minors are covered in the press now And while it used to be the case that after a minor turns 18, their name can be made public knowledge, this is no longer the case. And this doesn't just apply to minor victims. It also now applies to minor offenders. So where we saw the likes of Don Steenkamp's identity being revealed when he turned 18 while on trial, going forward, that will no longer be the case. And I will say that the benefits of this ruling for minor victims far outweigh any difficulties created for writers, journalists and other content creators. Their right to live a life unsullied by the crime perpetrated against them should absolutely be protected. But that does also mean that we don't get a heck of a lot of detail for episodes like this, and that's fair enough. In this case, the perpetrators of the crime were given pseudonyms, and those have been used in reporting. But in this case, those pseudonyms were not general names like Ms. X or Mr. Y. They were given actual names, which could be the names of normal, real people who didn't murder babies. And that concerns me a little, because it's very possible that innocent people could be blamed for things they had absolutely nothing to do with, simply because the offenders in question were given a pseudonym the same as that innocent person's name. So I'm not going to use those pseudonyms to refer to the offenders in this case. I'm simply going to refer to baby Daniel's mother as Daniel's mother, and her boyfriend, who was not biologically related to Daniel, as the boyfriend. Daniel is, of course, also not the child's real name, but this is how he's been referred to in court and in the media. We do have a little bit of information about Daniel's mother's background, 
thanks to the sentencing hearing and the social workers' reports. We know that her parents divorced when she was very young, and she grew up in a home where she claims abuse was the norm. She says that she regularly witnessed physical, emotional, and other forms of abuse between adults and by adults to children, and was a victim of abuse herself. She says that this caused her to grow into an adult who saw abuse and violence as the norm in homes. And, she says, this would underpin the theme in most of her adult relationships. Her family members would tell social workers that she'd been a very arrogant and stubborn child. But Daniel's mother says that she felt very isolated in her family and never felt as though she belonged. This may have been why she got into a serious relationship with the father of some of her children and Daniel's biological father when she was quite young. She spent six years with this man living in Nelspreit and had three children with him, including baby Daniel, who was just an infant when their marriage ended. It was at this time that she met and became involved with the boyfriend in question in this case. The pair moved into a house in Natarina, south of Johannesburg. Although her children moved with her into this house, almost immediately the children's biological father started proceedings to attempt to get full custody of the children. Her ex-partner claimed that towards the end of their relationship, Daniel's mother had started abusing alcohol and the situation had become so bad that he was driving around in the dark with the children in the car trying to find which bar she'd gone to so he could bring her home. When she left with the children, he immediately started legal proceedings to attempt to ensure the safety of his children, he said. In the interim, visitation was difficult, especially with Daniel's mother having moved provinces, and he hardly got to see his children. He did hear, though, that Daniel's mother had started taking drugs when she'd moved in with her new boyfriend, and this made him only more desperate to get his children out of the situation. It's important to note that the accused man in this case continues to claim that he never abused any of his girlfriend's children. Daniel's mother would change her story on many different occasions, but in the beginning, she too claimed she'd had no knowledge of, of physical abuse against her children by her boyfriend. Hospital records would show one hospital visit for baby Daniel during the almost three years that he lived with his mother and her boyfriend. On this occasion, he was taken to a hospital in the south of Johannesburg and treated for a broken leg. The record shows that he was taken to the hospital by Daniel's mother's boyfriend, who told staff he'd fallen out of a tree. This occurred in February 2016. There was one other hospital visit for a fractured elbow, but no written record could be obtained for this, and it's unknown whether it was before or after the leg injury. It's difficult to know exactly what baby Daniel's daily life was like. It doesn't appear he was attending a preschool, and it seems that for the most part when Daniel's mother was at home, she cared for him, and when she was working, he was in the care of her boyfriend, who didn't appear to be employed at that time. This, of course, meant that baby Daniel was very isolated from the world. No one would see what was happening to him, until it was too late. In June 2016, paramedics were called to the home of Daniel's mother and her boyfriend in Natarina, Johannesburg. On arrival, the medic would testify that he found a young child of about three laying on a bed in a bedroom. Please note that the following includes graphic descriptions of injuries to a child. The child's body was covered in what appeared to be burns of some kind. Although the mother of the child had said she just walked in to wake the child and found him to not be breathing, the medic said it appeared the child had been deceased for some time. As they would with any other child case, or of course in adults where there seemed to be hope of bringing the victim back, the medics did attempt to work on the child briefly. This is often helpful to parents when their child passes away, as even though the medic may know there's little hope, 
by working on the child, they give the parents the peace that everything was done. And of course, no medical professional wants to be in the presence of a deceased child. It's likely every professional's worst type of call. Soon, though, they had to break it to Daniel's mother that the child was deceased. It was immediately obvious that baby Daniel's death was possibly unnatural, and the police were called to the scene. This case initially came to my attention through the series Autopsy, the star of which is a friend of the show, Dr. Hestel von Staden, a committed and talented forensic pathologist. And although an autopsy on a child is an incredibly difficult thing to think about, it is, in fact, probably the main reason that justice was served for baby Daniel, and also the reason his siblings were saved from possibly the same fate. In the episode about this case, Dr. Van Staden recalls the day she first came in contact with baby Daniel's case. She was busy with her own autopsies for the day, when a colleague approached her with photographs of the autopsy he was busy with. The colleague's words to her were, Please tell me that I am not seeing what I think I'm seeing. Dr. Van Staden looked at the photographs, and upon seeing the injuries to the child, began to cry. Now, let's be clear here. This is a seasoned professional who has seen more horrors than most of us could even fathom. Things, as she's described it, no human being should ever have to see. But the evidence of what would later be described as torture on the small child's body was more than even she could be. I will again warn you that the details I'm about to share with you are very disturbing. The obvious injuries to baby Daniel were the burns to his skin. The child had sustained deep burns to about 60% of his skin surface. Immediately, Dr. Van Staden could tell that these burns were from liquid and not fire. Burns present differently on the skin depending on what caused the burns. Dr. Van Staden explains that, that it is not uncommon for her to see hot water burns in elderly people when they're running a bath and experience a heart attack or slip and fall into the bath. But there's also something about the way hot water burns present that can tell a forensic pathologist how the burning came to be. More on that later, though. In addition to the burn marks on baby Daniel, the autopsy also revealed an array of injuries which were at different stages of healing. These included the two injuries I've already referred to, his broken leg and fractured elbow, but there were also another 15 additional injuries picked up, including an old collection of blood on his brain, which would have been caused by a very hard blow to the head, contusions caused by blunt force trauma on his forehead, healed and healing contusions on various other parts of his body, fractured ribs, bruising on his lungs, and external injuries to his chest. Using histology, which is the study of the anatomy of biological tissues, so by comparing the material from the sites of various injuries across baby Daniel's body under a microscope, the pathologist was able to age the various injuries and confirm that they did not all occur at once. All injuries did happen before death, but essentially the injuries had been spread across most of the three-year-old's lifespan. Three of the injuries had undoubtedly occurred at the same time, though. The burns, the chest injury, and the injury to his forehead. The pathologist confirmed that any of those three injuries could have led to baby Daniel's death. After his death, His mother and her boyfriend were asked to provide statements about what had happened as part of the unnatural death investigation. The boyfriend claimed that he'd been preparing Daniel's bath the prior evening and he'd become distracted and the boy had fallen into the water. He said that he'd gotten him out and asked the boy if he was okay and the child said he was. 
The boyfriend claimed not to have noticed that any of the burns were that severe, and he didn't think the water was that hot. He said that shortly afterwards, the child had said he was sleepy, so he'd put him to bed. Daniel's mother said that she'd gotten home from work, and her boyfriend told her that Daniel had fallen into the bath, but that he was sleeping. She said she'd checked on him and then let him sleep, thinking that was probably the best thing for him. The next morning, when she went to wake Daniel up, she found that he was not breathing. She claimed she tried to give him CPR until the paramedics arrived. This story, though, did not fit the evidence found on Daniel's body. The patterns of burn marks were the most significant evidence. Dr. Van Staden explains that it is relatively easy to tell the difference between burn marks where someone has accidentally fallen into the water and those that are incurred when a person is forced into the water. Sadly, she has seen a few cases of child abuse both in real life and in textbooks where a child has been forced into a bathtub of hot water. The main difference lies in how the body reacts when a person is conscious and how they react or don't when they are unconscious and have fallen in. A conscious person will immediately attempt to get out of the water. They will struggle, and the struggle will be evident in which parts of the body are burned. Most significantly, the space under the legs where the knees bend is almost always not burned when a person is forced into the water. This is because a person forced into hot water will automatically bend their knees, pulling their legs up towards their abdomen to get away from the water. This bending action protects that part of the skin from being burned. Hands are often less burned too, as these will immediately fly out of the water to attempt to fight against the person forcing them in. A person who's fallen into water by accident does not immediately know this is happening. If they're unconscious, burn patterns will be uniform, and if they fell in accidentally but were conscious, the burn patterns will often be less severe, as the person can immediately push themselves out. The skin behind baby Daniel's knees was almost completely unblemished. His hands were not as badly burned as some of his body. This undoubtedly told the forensic pathologist that the child had not fallen in. Instead, chillingly, he had been forced into the water and held there while he flailed and pulled his legs up, attempting to escape the searing pain. Considering the mother's claim that she'd attempted CPR on the boy, the forensic pathologist then went about assessing whether the chest injuries could have been as a result of untrained CPR. Performing CPR on a young child is very different from performing it on an adult, and a person who's not trained in child first aid can do more harm than good when attempting CPR. The paramedics who attended the scene, though, and the forensic pathologist, knew that Daniel had died some time during the night. By the time his mother found him in the morning, he was long deceased. If the chest injuries had been caused by her attempts at CPR, these would clearly have presented as post-mortem injuries. In such injuries, the appearance differs from injuries sustained while you're alive because your blood stops flowing when your heart stops beating, and as such, bruising and blood collection patterns around the injuries are different. The pathologist did not see this in the chest contusions on baby Daniel. The injuries could not have been caused by attempts at CPR because Daniel was still alive when the injuries were sustained. With this evidence in mind, the investigating officer was summoned and the findings delivered. Baby Daniel's death had not been as the result of a tragic accident. The child had been the victim of sustained abuse over a period of years, and on the night of his death, he had been subjected to a form of torture and at least two blunt force injuries. Baby Daniel had been murdered. 
After baby Daniel's death, his mother initially moved out of the home she'd shared with her boyfriend. She soon discovered, though, that she was pregnant with the man's child and moved back in with him. Eight months after baby Daniel's death in April 2017, his mother and her boyfriend were arrested on charges of child neglect, child abuse and murder. By this time, Daniel's mother had already given birth to her boyfriend's child and this infant, as well as the woman's two surviving children, Daniel's siblings, were taken into the care of the state until it could be determined where a safe place would be for them to go. The pair immediately applied for bail and it would be during this hearing that Daniel's mother's version of events would suddenly change. Eight months after her son's death, and only after she herself was now under threats of prison time, Daniel's mother claimed that she'd known about the abuse her boyfriend had been inflicting on her children, but she'd been powerless to stop it, as the relationship was abusive. She claimed that she'd developed what is referred to as learned helplessness, which is absolutely a real phenomenon in coercively controlling and abusive relationships, and it was for this reason that she'd not sought assistance for Daniel. The woman claimed that she'd feared for her life and the lives of her children under threat from her boyfriend and had been too scared to seek assistance, even when she was presented with opportunities to do so during custody hearings brought against her by her previous partner. She further claimed that on the day of the incident that had led to Daniel's death, She'd received a message from her boyfriend while she was at work, stating that he had, quote, fucked him up for good this time, end quote. When she got home, she now claimed that she'd examined Daniel and only noticed a small burn on his cheek. She'd asked him if he was okay, and the boy said he was. She'd put him to bed. She claimed that she had wanted to take him to hospital for treatment, but her boyfriend had stopped her and threatened her. She did say, though, that she hadn't thought Daniel's injuries were life-threatening. During the bail hearing, her refusal to get her child help became the biggest sticking point in cross-examination. Dr. Hestel van Staden testified in this hearing as the original pathologist was not available, and after her evidence was led, it became clear that no sane person could have looked at Daniel that night and not believed he needed immediate medical treatment. The basis of the state's case, though, was that the fatal injuries to Daniel had not occurred when his mother was present, so essentially the murder charge would be directed at her boyfriend, who the state claimed had physically held Daniel in the water as a form of torture, struck his head against a hard surface, possibly the bath itself, and then either punched or kicked the child in the chest. The boyfriend was denied bail, but Daniel's mother was granted bail with strict conditions. She had to regularly report to the investigating officer on the case, she was not allowed to leave the province, and she was not allowed to contact her surviving children, who were considered witnesses in the case. Throughout the wait for the trial to begin, though, Daniel's mother continually flouted her bail conditions. She went on holiday to Port Elizabeth without letting anyone know. She arranged for her mother to pick up one of her children for a visitation so that she could speak to the child on the phone. And she simply seemed to have little regard for the seriousness of the charges against her and her boyfriend. Her behaviour in court and throughout the bail hearing and eventual trial was also flagged as quite strange by the state prosecutor. The woman changed lawyers three or four times throughout the process. This seemed to happen when her attorneys gave her advice she didn't like, or when they wouldn't follow her instructions, because what she asked was either unethical or impossible to achieve. The prosecutor later said that the woman carried herself not with the air of the grief one would expect of a mother who just lost her child in a horrific way, but rather with a level of arrogance he's rarely seen in a defendant. 
Of course, it's only fair to acknowledge that everyone reacts differently to grief. And if you have suffered such an immeasurable loss, when you find yourself in a situation where you're now essentially fighting for your freedom, perhaps you do need to switch off your emotions for a while and just fight the fight while you can. This attitude, though, seemed to stand in complete contrast to how the woman had claimed she'd felt during her relationship. Although it often takes years for a survivor of of coercive control and abuse to recover from that kind of trauma, and for a long time after the relationship ends, the victim will still struggle with this idea of learned helplessness and poor self-esteem, Daniel's mother seemed to step right back into self-assured and forthright mode as soon as she was arrested and separated from her boyfriend. This too seemed strange, considering she'd still been living with the man right up until the very day she was arrested, and just eight months before, she claimed to have felt so helpless and terrified she couldn't call for help for her dying child. As the trial loomed, the woman's version seemed less and less likely. Daniel's mother would remain out on bail for the entire period of the trial against her and her boyfriend, which started in late 2017. Her boyfriend's case remained that he was not guilty of murder, as he had not intentionally injured Daniel. He also claimed he had never abused Daniel's mother or her other children. As the trial got underway, Daniel's mother was able to present a few witnesses who were members of her family, who said that her boyfriend had seemed to be a bit controlling. Unfortunately, all of these witness testimonies surrounded things that people had been told by Daniel's mother, and not things they'd actually witnessed themselves, which was, in essence, hearsay. Although the boyfriend would claim that none of the prior injuries to the child were his fault, the two main injuries, the broken leg and the fractured elbow, were both sustained when Daniel was alone in the man's care. Daniel's oldest sibling had also told his mother, when she'd returned home on the day that Daniel had broken his leg, that the child had not been in a tree, and that her boyfriend had broken the child's leg in a rage. When questioned during the trial as to why, if she was so afraid of her boyfriend, she'd gone back to live with him after Daniel's death, the woman claimed she hadn't initially wanted to believe her boyfriend could have purposefully harmed Daniel so badly, but when family members had started to question whether he may be responsible for the child's death, she'd moved out. Then, she said, she discovered she was pregnant with the man's child, and when she'd called him to discuss the matter, he'd started to threaten her and her family members if she didn't move back in with him. On this point, it is not uncommon at all for abused partners to return to the abuser multiple times on their way out of a relationship. In this case, though, I think we, as the judge did, have to view the situation on the totality of evidence. And that evidence includes Daniel's mother's actions and behavior before, during, and after Daniel's death. And really, the key here is not to determine whether or not Daniel's mother was a victim of any form of abuse. It's to understand whether, on the night of his death, she'd acted in a manner which was neglectful of her parental duties. The state pointed out that on the two previous occasions that Daniel had sustained serious injury, he'd been taken to hospital. And although that is not uncommon in abuse situations, as abusers will often use this to set up the whole it was an accident premise, it did seem significant that Daniel was taken to two different hospitals for each of those injuries, despite one of the hospitals being less than a kilometer from the home and there being absolutely no reason for him to have been taken elsewhere, unless his caregivers were concerned that the hospital staff would start to wonder about the little three-year-old boy who seemed so terribly accident-prone. Judge Colin Machitze asked Daniel's mother while she was on the stand if she'd not been concerned about all the injuries her son was sustaining while he was in her boyfriend's care. 
he asked whether she didn't think it was negligent for a biological parent to ignore constant injuries appearing on their child, especially as serious as broken bones. The woman had no answer to this, but broke down into hysterical crying, and the court had to be postponed. When the woman took the stand again, she recounted how her boyfriend had threatened the lives of her other children. On one occasion, she claimed he'd put her daughter behind the wheel of a car parked on an inclined driveway and said he was going to release the handbrake and see what happened. On another occasion, the woman recounted how baby Daniel had defecated in his bed as he was not fully potty trained yet and she claimed that her boyfriend had made the child eat some of his feces as punishment. The story shocked the entire court into silence. The woman told it as though she were just telling any other story, but the absolutely horrific detail was stunning. Later, the prosecutor would say, quote, For a mother to sit by, while a man makes a child eat his feces, is a thing I cannot understand. On its own, my lord, this warrants imprisonment. End quote. For her part, Daniel's mother claimed she'd done everything she could to protect her children. She said that although her boyfriend had tried to limit how much food they were allowed to eat, she would hide food for them. But when her boyfriend found out about this, He made her eat all of the food. This seemingly mild punishment, compared to some of the horrific things she'd said he'd done to her children, again seemed completely incongruous with her story of terror and fear for her life. The boyfriend's attorney challenged everything Daniel's mother said. The message she claimed he'd sent to her on the day Daniel died was brought up again, and his attorney argued that the woman had no proof of this message, and if she did, why would she not have taken it to police after Daniel died as proof of her boyfriend's so-called calculated actions? I don't know whether the couple's electronic devices were looked at in the days after Daniel died. This message doesn't seem to have had any basis in solid evidence, but the attorney would also argue that there would be no reason for the boyfriend to use the words this time because he claimed to have never harmed the child before, and all the incidents had been accidental injuries. By the 19th of December 2018, both the defence and the state had rested their cases, and the judge retired to arrive at a decision. Within days, he was ready to deliver his verdict. Judge Machitze said that, quote, Accused one, Daniel's mother, is found guilty of two counts of contravening the provisions of Section 305, Subsection 3A of the Children's Act 38 of 2005. Accused 2, the boyfriend, is found guilty as charged, that is, contravening the provisions of Sections 305, Subsection 3 of the Children's Act 2005, and Counts 2, murder, read with the provisions of Section 51, Subsection 1 of Act 105 of 1997. End quote. He went on to say that, quote, Accused one must have been aware or should have foreseen what was happening. However, being afraid of accused number two, she became silent, and her silence caused the death of her son. End quote. In making this statement, it became clear that the judge had found some value in Daniel's mother's claims of being in an abusive relationship. He had, however, as I mentioned, looked at the totality of evidence and found that the level of fear she was under should not have superseded her child's right to live a safe life, nor his very right to live at all. The horror of the details that had emerged in this case, of course, had the public in an uproar. Children's rights groups attended the court proceedings regularly and lined the gates outside the court with banners calling for life sentences for child abusers and murderers. There's a video in circulation where a family member of one of the defendants, in a rage, 
tears the banners off the gate by hand and dumps them in a dustbin. One can only wonder whose rights that individual was more concerned about. After being found guilty, Daniel's mother was taken into custody. She applied for bail, saying that she needed to be able to work to support her children, and she claimed that she'd been a model bailee during her trial. The state vehemently contested this, though, raising the points I discussed earlier about her breaches of her bail conditions, and the judge agreed that she'd not earned the right to additional bail before sentencing was passed down. The judge also said that he thought it was quite presumptuous of the woman to assume she would not be receiving a custodial sentence. Her bail application seemed to imply that she believed she would be given a fine or a suspended sentence, but the judge pointed out that he was well within his rights to give her prison time should he see fit, and she should keep that in mind. She was kept in custody while the courts took a brief break for Christmas. Sentencing proceedings would start in April 2019, and both sides would be given the opportunity to present evidence and testimony in mitigation and aggravation of sentence. It was during the sentencing hearing that the court heard about the abuse of childhood Daniel's mother had experienced. The state argued that Daniel's mother had multiple opportunities, including visits from social workers during her custody battles, to secure the safety of her children. Those very custody disputes, in fact, they said, were the perfect opportunity to save her children, as she could have relented and given her ex-partner custody of, of his biological children, including Daniel. This would have been the ideal scenario, the state said, to ensure she wouldn't have had to incur the wrath of her boyfriend, because she could have simply claimed to have failed to prove her custody case. Rather, though, the state said, the woman seemed intent on withholding the children from their biological father, seeming to see them as trophies of some personal battle rather than human beings who needed to be protected. On the 4th of April, the judge was ready to hand down sentence. For the murder and torture of baby Daniel, he gave the boyfriend a life sentence. For child neglect, which led to her son's death, he sentenced Daniel's mother to 20 years behind bars. He described what Daniel had endured as nothing less than torture, saying, quote, You have taken the life of an innocent child who was looking at you and seeking protection from you. A short period of imprisonment will defeat the purpose of rehabilitation. End quote. It seems significant to the judge that even the defense's own social worker witnesses had recommended direct imprisonment as the only fair sentence for both defendants. Daniel's mother may be eligible for parole when she has served half of her sentence, which will be in 2029. She will be 39 years old. Her boyfriend may be eligible for parole in 25 years, which will be in 2042. He will be 61 years old. Although cases like Daniel's are extremely difficult to cover and listen to, I continue to do so because I know that people are listening. When I covered the case of Poppy van der Merwe, who died in tragically similar circumstances, that episode started a really incredible conversation about child welfare and how we can differentiate between cases where parents need support and cases that need to be reported immediately and how we can do that. For the most part, if you're aware of anything you suspect to be child abuse, the safest thing is to report. Sometimes children are not necessarily being abused or neglected, but the caregivers do need support for a variety of reasons and may be too proud to ask. They may also be afraid that if they do ask, their children will be taken away. And that is another reason people don't always report information they have about child abuse, because they're worried that they may be wrong and a child could be removed from their parents' care without cause. But although our child protection system is not what it should be, 
I can tell you from personal experience that the last thing the department actually wants to do is remove a child from the care of the parents. Firstly, they actually don't have enough space for children to be placed in. And secondly, it is their mandate to heal families, not tear them apart. Anyone who's tried to adopt a child who's been removed from the care of their parents will know just how many hoops you have to jump through to actually sever legal parental rights. I know most won't appreciate the comparison, but it's very much the same reasoning that can be applied to the work the SPCA does with animals. They too have limited resources and far too few opportunities to place animals into new homes. So where they can, their first step is always to try and support the owners to rectify the care issues. And often, that's all it takes, is some support. In baby Daniel's case, support would not really have helped, unless his mother was willing to leave her boyfriend. But also in his case, a telephone call may have been life-saving. Something the judge brought up during the trial is that when Daniel was experiencing these injuries over a long period of time, he would have been in a lot of pain. There is no doubt that he would have screamed, cried out for help. There were other people that lived on the same property as baby Daniel and his family. Not a single one did anything. I cannot even fathom, nor do I really want to imagine, the sound a child must make when they are forced into a bathtub of boiling water. How do you, as a human being, ignore that? I know people don't want to get involved, and I'm sure the boyfriend was not an approachable man but someone could have phoned the police. Maybe they didn't want to because they had their own secrets to hide. So many cases of abuse involve children whose parents are separated from the biological parent, get into a new relationship, and the new step-parent becomes the abuser. It is a real pattern, and it's concerning. And although I don't think it's the case here, because of what we know about the opportunities Daniel's mother had to save her children, I often think that it also comes down to the support that single parents receive. Being on your own with children is hard, no matter if you're a mother or a father. Throw in substance abuse and poverty, and it makes for an even more difficult situation. So I think that sometimes when a new partner comes on the scene, the relief of that shared burden is perhaps far too enticing. It may just cause some people to look the other way. But again, I can't help but think that you wouldn't be able to look the other way if you didn't already have that in you to begin with. I, for instance, and again, forgive the comparison, I don't have children, so it's my only basis to relate, cannot foresee a single situation where I would look away when someone I lived with was abusing my pets. It just wouldn't happen. And I'm sure most mothers and fathers listening would say exactly the same thing about their children. So what is it that makes people look away from their child's pain? What is it that overrides that part of them that is geared toward protecting that child? There's another similarity we see in cases of this nature, and it's the biological parents claiming abuse from the partner. It's happened in every case I've covered, and while I'm never one to not believe someone who says they've been abused, in a case like this, I think we have no choice but to say, although we're very sorry for what you may have suffered, we cannot condone what you allowed to happen, no matter what you endured. When cases like this darken our horizon, all I can do is look to the people who, day after day, continue to fight for justice for children like baby Daniel. 
and one single line, actually one single word, in what Dr. Hestelf and Starden said about this case, says everything I need to hear about those who endure some of the most horrific experiences to continue in the war against people like Daniel's murderer. She was speaking about how it's not viable to become emotionally involved in cases because then you won't be able to do your job properly. And then she explains how there are certain people, though, that always stay with you. People. She says people, not cases. And right there is hope. If someone who works in the kind of environment and sees the kinds of things that Dr. Van Staden does after all her years of practice can still see the bodies that arrive on her autopsy table as people, then I think that there is still hope in this often dark and tragic world of ours. And maybe that's what we all have to do. Stop seeing the child screaming next door as an annoyance or the raging parents as a bad neighbor, and start to see them as people. Human beings who, although they may be nowhere near the type of situation that baby Daniel was in, may also not be far off. And ask yourself, would you rather hear me tell another story where I have to give you five different warnings about disturbing content around injury to a child? Or would you rather pick up a phone? and make a phone call. I know what I'd rather you do. Baby Daniel would be 10 years old this year. He would have started school. Perhaps he would be living back with his dad like his siblings now are. His physical scars from those first three years of horror would have started to fade. And maybe he would still occasionally wake up in the middle of the night with his heart racing not sure which monster he was being chased by in his dreams. But within minutes, he'd be comforted again, assured that he was safe now, that the monster would never hurt him again. And as he was lulled back to sleep by the loving hands and voice he'd always deserved, maybe he'd drift back into a happier dream with a small smile on his face. And maybe, just maybe, we can picture him doing just that, right now, somewhere out there. Baby Daniel, rest in key. Thank you for listening to episode 108, The Murder of Baby Daniel. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon.